Okay. Um. Mm, okay. So, shall I open us in a word of prayer before we start? Or if anyone likes to volunteer? Okay. Let's get let's get the show on the road. Everyone bow your heads. Father, we come we come before you today or tonight, in fact, to um come and. Uh, think upon your word and listen and hear, see what you have for us to read. We pray that the, the, the words that you told your disciple John to tell the churches um, that they should heed shall live in our hearts and that we should heed it as well. I thank you for the people that were able to come tonight and I pray that you give us a, a, a understanding heart. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 So, does any or so we here read the church of Pergamum and took some notes and thought of some questions like I said last week I know you didn't I know you didn't but I'm asking the other people so anybody thought no I'm not gonna pre I'm not gonna pressure you here because you know I'm not gonna single you out but if you did take um, ask questions you know any early ones? Okay, and that—that's okay. That's okay. So, oh. ah, that is a good question. That is a good question. Oh, okay. Now I gotta move this thing because I can't see the chat. Hold on. Let me just—I don't need it. Okay, what's hold on? What did Luke say? This is just for Colin. Okay. Anyway, um, the hidden man that we will get into. You will see, you will see that later. That is a excellent question. So, who wants to read twelve through seventeen? Who wants to read the Church of Pergamum? Uh, well, we also never hear. Oh, okay, yeah. Man, if you want to read. I think we can, I think we can. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, any thoughts on what was just read? Because there are some very interesting points in here. So, the days of Antipas, or Antip Antipas, Antipas, however you want, Antipas, however you want to pronounce it. Well, not much is known about Antipas, because, well. Not much is known about him. All all that's known here is he he's mentioned maybe once or twice or there's no recorded books about him or any special thing or any teaching he theology he thought about. But all that said here is that he was a faithful witness. Okay, what do you know about him? What do I know about him? All I know is that no, I, I don't know about Antifas. He's just kind of there, but he, but, but think about it this way, think about it this way, even though there's not much known about him, well, yes, he was a martyr, yes, but even though we only know that he's just a martyr and he's some faithful witness, 
Jesus knows about him, and Jesus knows all his life, so he was good enough to be known personally by Jesus, to, for Jesus to call him by name, and to say his faithful witness, I mean, that's a pretty big mention. So, I may not know a whole lot about him, there's not some book about him, but Jesus knows him, so that's pretty big. Okay, I'm going to just mute chat. There we go. So, <clears throat> thank you for ruining chat whoever did that. So, let's start in verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamon, right. These are the words of him who is a sharp double-edged sword. Sharp double-edged sword. That sounds familiar. That means, like I said last week, you know how he said... Uh, you remember how I said John has a different introduction for Jesus, like, basically every time he talks to a church? He takes a, he takes a characteristic of Jesus, like, I know this and this and this because it's what I saw on the island of Patmos. And he, and it's actually kind of cool, because, like, last week he says, to the words of him who was first and last, who died and came to life again. And the whole um, scenario of that church was that they were suffering and they were being persecuted and he and and through that introduction it was saying i was persecuted persecuted too and i and i rose believe in me and that was like and that was like perfectly um stringed together for them and the one before that says um there are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands this one was more like an authority thing because ephesus was pretty high um, and influence and over everyone and you and he introduced Jesus saying well this guy is a lot higher than you and so even like your works might be um um good but you're not loving him and he has the power to take away you know your influence you're not you're not the highest he is so you know every introduction has its correspondence with that church and this one saying these are the words who has a sharp double-edged sword, which is um, mentioned in chapter 1 in, uh, where was it? Well, it's, 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 here we go, yeah, 16. And it's right, um, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. And in this case, the correspondence is that um, the this church was a good church. They were faithful. But the flip side was that they were um, compromising with a lot of doctrines there. And a double-edged sword, as you know, can be very helpful or it can hinder very, um, very badly. Or like in, in the case, Jesus having the double-edged sword, you know, um, and the law, because, you know, the law was his word. The, the word was his word. You know, once you hear the law, you know, it wakes you up like, oh, I have sinned. These guys are like. Um, they're holding fast and they're saying listen to what he's um, listen to what Jesus is saying and He's like it wakes us up. But at the same time the moment we know the law the more more is required And so the double-edged sword is that it can also have with um, swift judgment the day we die if we don't listen So the one who has double-edged sword is here to um, show us the truth and bring judgment because he's not a lamb anymore. He's a ruler, as it says, when he comes back. <laughs> he's saying, hey, this thing ain't for looks. I'll come down there and fight them myself. But... <laughs> I planted y'all. <laughs> so ex that's ex that's exactly right. And so the next verse, verse 13, he says, or like Matt said, I know where you live. <laughs> uh -huh. Where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. So, uh, or you did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, 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 my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. So that right there, like how I was saying, um, um, Smyrna was a, uh, or Ephesus was an influential city. All these churches are somewhere where it's with a lot of people. That's where it gets its golden lampstand because it can reach a lot of people. And so the problem with Pergamum is the um, the uh, the social pressure, the pressure to conform to the world. But they wanna they wanna have the truth where it's still 
Jesus? But they still want to, you know, like, oh, that's a good doctrine. Especially like, oh, that's, oh, Nicolaitans. I like y'all. Come in here. I mean, I know we should be rebuking y'all, but y'all sound good. And that was the problem. Because, and Jesus, uh, as it said here, it says Satan's throne. This is where Satan lives. This is where Satan reigns. Right here in Pergamum. Now, his throne may not literally be in Pergamum, but this is a part where it's like a capital city. Satan, Satan is roaming around here pretty strong and um, captivating the minds of a lot of people. And he's saying, even though there's so many people against you, you're still holding fast to my word. And he's giving credit to that. He's saying, you, you know, you might be hated by a few people or this case maybe hundreds and thousands but that doesn't change the fact that um that you're not denouncing it you're not saying okay you know what yeah you're right uh, we give up we'll just i'll i guess i'll go um eat some food of the sacrifice idols as we read a little bit later or i'll go practice some sh sexual immorality also as we read later they're holding fast to it and he says later you know or he, he said um, in the in the verse, he says, you did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas. So I'm assuming Antipas was a brother, maybe a high um, uh, a pastor, uh, a preacher. And since his, he was martyred, martyred meaning, you know, he was killed for his faith. So he's saying, even though y'all witnessed them taking Antipas and um, killing him because he believed in me so much, that didn't make y'all stumble. That didn't make y'all hesitant. Y'all still went with full courage, with full confidence with me and believing in me and not stopping and saying, like, good job. And this is a, like it says here, where um, he was put to death, where Satan lives. I'm saying it again because this place was heavily guarded by people who, like, cancel culture and, and black lives matter i'm not saying those are bad but i'm saying you know people who have this circular secular thinking you know and can't exactly it's just this whole marketplace of evil but nevertheless this is what the churches that had a problem and it says verse 14 nevertheless i have a few things against you you have people here or people there who hold to the teachings of balaam does anybody who remember Balaam is? Is he the one who was Yes. He was told, or, because it, it says earlier, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites. So Balak being the king of, shoot, his kingdom started with an H. But anyway, so Balak was a king, right? And so who remembers the story of some dude getting on a donkey and he's trying to go somewhere and there's an angel in his path that's invisible to him but the donkey sees and he and the donkey like bruises his leg bruises his arm and saying you dumb donkey go along the path and god opens the donkey's mouth and the donkey's like dude there's an angel right there with a flaming sword i'm not gonna go forward and have you killed stop whipping me who remembers that <laughs> that that's This exactly. This is the same Balaam. This is well. This is before um, he um, tried to curse the Israelites. So you know, Balak called uh, Balak called Balaam and was like, "Hey man, Israelites have God on their side. I'm gonna need you to come and curse them for me. I will pay you handsomely." And then you have the story, like I just said, with the donkey, the angel of him. And finally, God was like, you know what? I'll let you go, but I'm not going to let you curse them. And so heed my word. And so while Balaam went to Balak, he goes, okay, uh, prepare, prepare an altar where I can do my thing, you know. And for four times, the first time, he went to the altar and he blessed the Israelites. And Balak got mad and he built another altar, said, do it again. He blessed. He built another altar. Balaam went, blessed. He did it again. He blessed. And after this, Balak got some money. He's like, why can't you curse? And he goes, God told me not to curse the Israelites. Because then that will fall. Or, yeah, he wouldn't. <laughs> exactly. Well, he's heeding. 
And he's saying, well, you see, this would all, because if I do this, it would fall upon my head. But let me tell you something here. Let me tell you something here. I have a suggestion. You know, if you take your Moabite women, or, you know, your women, go and, go and entice the Israelites to sin. That way, it will fall upon their own head, because they can't resist. They will, um, because it says here, you know, he, um, Balak enticed the Israelites to sin by eating food, sacrificed to idols, and, um, by committing sexual immorality. So, Balaam gave a suggestion. Well, I can't do this because, you know, I don't want to be punished, but if you just send some women to seduce them, it will fall upon their own thing, or put on their own head by their own sweat and brow, and God will judge them. And that would be their own hands. And Balak's like, that's a good idea. So he sent some women. And the Israelites' men couldn't resist. And so they followed them. And they made, they had many parties. And they were like, and the women, like, you know, were like, hey, it's okay. You can eat the food sacrificed to idols. You can do this and that. It's okay. I'm here for you. And they're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And he's like, <laughs> don't, don't. <laughs> oh dang it, I'm recording. That's gonna be on record whatever. Anyway, so you know, and they're committing the sin. And that's what he's having, and that's the problem with this church here. Um men are being enticed in the city by any um by sins that are happening around them. They're like, Oh, stealing. You know, I always wanted that candy bar. Or ooh, shoplifting. Or ooh, killing. I don't know if I don't think anyone went, ooh, killing, except a really deranged serial killer. But, you know, or, ooh, a woman. You know, there's all these things that's going on and saying some of y'all are conforming to the word, uh, world, just like how back in the days of Balaam and Balak, they conformed to the world. And so he gives a heeding in verse 10, or, sorry, or, uh, sorry, in verse 15, he's saying, likewise, also have those who hold up the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Um, who remembers what I said the Nicolaitans doctrine was last week? Was it last week? Or? I mean, two weeks ago. Yeah, but who remembers the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Exactly. Exactly. And that's a problem. You cannot do whatever you want. The moment you are saved, you are telling God... I trust you, I believe in you, and I will give my life to you. Meaning, not my will be done anymore, but your will be done. So it's not a, oh, thank you for saving me, now I'm going to go do whatever I want. No, it's, thank you for saving me, what can I do for you? And it's not, it's not, exactly, well, you're not. That's <laughs> Yeah, it's more, it's more of a get out of jail free card, it's like, oh. I'm good. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not, buddy. And that's that's the problem. He's saying some of you are acting like you are. Um, you're you're okay. You're not. You're. This is the problem with the Nicolaite. This is the problem which was the Church of Ephesus that lost its lampstand. And I don't want y'all to lose your lampstand. And like I was now, I was saying the heating. He was saying, repent, therefore, turn back, please. Otherwise. I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So repent, or I will, I don't know, physically, or I don't know with the word, or with the words of his speaking, because, you know, double-edged sword, you know, that's, um, because, um, when you put on the, um, put on the suit of armor, the sword is the word, you know, he might speak something against his enemies. Either way, he's going to calm down, and he's going to fight against them. But it's not going to be like, y'all guys did good, let me take it from here. No, it's going to be like, y'all guys disappointed me, let me take it from here. And he's like, don't, please, repent. I want y'all to be with me. I want y'all to be with me, and I want and I, 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 wanna, I want y'all to be with me as much as I want to be with you. And he's saying, in verse 17, he who has an ear, let him hear what, let him hear what spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear, listen to my word, please. I'm trying to help y'all. And he's saying, to him who overcomes. So to the person that doesn't conform to the world that is happening all around him, to the person that listens to my word, who stays faithful, like my witness Antipas, 
None of us know who he is, but like I was saying earlier, the Lord knows who he is. Who cares if some political leaders who you are? Who cares if there's a whole documentary on YouTube about who you are? None of that matters if the Lord doesn't know who you are. That's the only thing. You're not a, you're not special if Jesus doesn't know who you are. He's saying to the one who overcomes, listen, and I will give you hidden manna. And you asked what hidden manna meant, right? There was a verse that goes, um, when Jesus was out in the wilderness being tempted by the devil, he said, man cannot live on bread alone, right? And manna back in um in the in, in the uh, the Pentateuch Pentateuch he um manna went every day. I, I forgot how to say the Pentateuch. Sorry, the Torah. Let's say Torah. Um, manna fell from this guy every day except Sunday because you had to gather it twice on Saturday. But it fell every day to provide to provide for the Israelites. Right. Well, saying here, I'll give you hidden manna. I will give you the spiritual food. Look, I provided them with regular manna, and right here, your faith is dwindling. So if you can overcome with the faith of a mustard seed, I will give you this um, hidden manna. I will give you this spiritual food. I will fill you until your cup overflows, and your faith will grow exponentially. You will be the crop that um, grows abundantly times a hundred in the parable of the sower. If you overcome, if you stay true, if you stay faithful to me. And then he says... I will give some. Um, I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. That's pretty cool. Imagine having a plaque with a stone with whatever the heck that says on it. Probably some weird Hebrew writing. If I could read Hebrew or whatever language we can read it on. Exactly. Exactly. How cool that is. How cool it is to just have a stone and like, hmm, that's my name. When I get into heaven, I won't be referred to as Simon. I will be referred to as whatever the Lord wants to call me. I mean, if... <laughs> or, well, I'll have a new name. That's, that's what, that's what matters. Stay focused. That's what matters. You'll have a new name written on a white stone. That would be a pretty cool, dang piece of artifact to have in your home. And he's saying, I will give it to you. But, but, you will have to overcome. You will have to stay faithful to me like my faithful servant and to pass. But don't be deceived. Right now, especially in this era, right now, you can go outside and you can see um, if your if your mind is in critical thinking, you can see on TV, you can see on YouTube, you can see in marketing um, strategies, you can see how the way people talk, the way the people act. This is not a Christian world. This world is falling apart, and every day it's creeping closer, it's deceiving closer. But it tries to be comforted, like no, it's okay, it's okay to do this. Just like the woman who um, um, Balak sent to the Israelites, it's okay, you can do this. Trust me, your God wouldn't mind. Try our gods. It's okay. It's okay. You can do this. You can go and you can go and do whatever you want to that person. It's okay. You can go and steal that candy bar. It's okay. You know why? Because I'll be here for you. No, that whatever is telling you that, that is gonna be in a prison for eternity after Jesus is done with it, and you'll be with it. You have to overcome. You can't let the deception um, beat you. I I heard um, a quote from Steve Harvey, and he and he said, um, "There will always be a choice in your life, a turning point per se. I call it a movement, a movement choice." And he says, "The only way to get where you want to be, the place where you think you know that's the place, is to not give up, is to never give up." Now, I'm thinking, oh, that makes sense. But at the same time, we as Christians, we strive to be just like Jesus. We'll never be there, of course. We will never. But we can try to be. We can try to be as holy and righteous. I mean, it will get us somewhere. It will give us some benefits. Not as much benefit as is never being, um, never giving up and um, always loving the Lord. 
we can try the good deeds. I mean, not to say that's wrong. But the other option is to give up and move back and feel like you'll never get there. That's what's happening here. Some of people are giving up and some people are saying, yeah, but I like the teachings of the Nicolaitans. It sounds pretty good. But there are also some people who are saying, no, no, I, I'm in my right mind. I know what Jesus has told me. I am hearing and I am listening to the word. Just like it says in verse 17, he who has an ear, let him hear. Don't be deceived. Am I losing anyone? Good. Good. This is this is one of the this is one of the churches, not to put on um, on top of any other church, but this is a good church to make sure you're paying attention. I don't want to lose anyone in this one. Very relatable. Exactly. If this was 2,000 years ago where this was written, right? And say, Satan's throne, say, where Satan was dwelling was here in Pergamum, here in Smyrna, here in Ephesus, in that little part of Asia, right? We're 2,000 years later. Satan is all around the earth. He's always been all around the earth. And he is here more than ever. So it's, it's pretty easy to spot him. It's just up to us whether we're going to, you know, do something about it, whether we're going to stay faithful or not. It's a, it, like I said, it's a movement choice where you're going to move forward or you're going to move backwards. Exactly. That's what this, this Bible study, like, like, like you said, we have to go out there. We have to get uncomfortable to tell the people there is a comfortable place. This Bible study that, I, um, that I've started, I hope y'all really engage in, it's not here, you know, to make y'all, aw, Jesus loves me, let's go, Jesus loves me, for da, 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 peace of mind. No, it's, it's going to be uncomfortable at times. I'm here to tell y'all the truth and say, y'all are going to be deceived. Y'all are here facing a choice. There is going to be a Satan of whatever sin out there just for you telling y'all it's okay to sin. It's going to happen. That is that is a perk of believing in Jesus. He says, you know, you will be hated. You will be persecuted. It's going to happen. This isn't a feel good. As um, the pastor of New Harvest in which Ben goes for youth, he says the same thing. This isn't... To make y'all, this isn't to make y'all feel good. The go, um, the gospel, especially Revelation. This whole thing, as it says in Greek, it's called apocalypsis. Now you know it means unveiling, revealing. It's not gonna feel good. It's gonna be on point, whether you want to accept it or not. The more uncomfortable you get, the more refined you'll get. The more defined you'll get. It's a striking of iron. As iron sharpens iron, brother sharpens brother. Any thoughts? Any questions? Yes. Connection area. I'm sure he's going to rejoin. It's okay. All right, good. Any questions from any of y'all? I want, I want to make sure I, I'm making y'all, uh, making this very understandable. I think there he is. Ben, you have any questions for the group? Being the junior. You have any any thoughts? So. I mean, I kind of like. I mean, yeah, the yeah the white stone like a trophy, the crown of life you will receive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
There's so many things. So many things to look forward. It's just that that's not to say this is the message of the week, guys. Listen, there there's many things going on in this one little tiny chapter. You wouldn't have thought I would have said all of this out of this one thing. There are there are many preachers who could just speak this much out of one sentence. So to make one message, it's hard to do. But one thing I can say is don't give up. Don't be deceived. Because there is, like Ben said, many rewards out there. Um, before I close in prayer, um, anybody want to say anything? Alright. Anyway, if y'all would bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, thank you for this time. Um, to be in your word. I, I know you're here with us. I know you've been watching over each and every one of them as you have been me all this time. I thank you for giving um, giving John um, your, your writings, your teachings to tell to the church in Pergamum that we can read over it and we can apply it to our own life. I thank you being the Lord and Savior that you are. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.